All right, mate, go ahead. You're good to go, Stella. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stella Ellingborg, and I'm coming to you from Norway this evening. I'm delighted and honored to introduce to you two very special authors here, one of whom have written on a subject that I'm involved in, which is uh, Vikings. And um, I'll mention, in fact, you can catch the final episode of The Secrets of the Viking Stone on Discovery Channel this week, actually. But before I introduce the, uh, the evening's program, we have a breaking news story that I'm sure you have all been captivated by. As explorers, we're used to um, experiencing the unexpected. And for the past few days, the entire world has been watching and waiting to see what will be the fate um, for a ship stuck in the Suez Canal because of a sandstorm. And tonight, just to give us an update on the situation, is retired Rear Admiral Golodet. And, uh, and um, before I uh, invite you to, to um, um, Tim Golodet, he is driving today towards Miami, and Neil is in Sweden, I am in Norway, and uh, Lawrence, you are in uh, New York, so we're all over at the, at the time now. And uh, Rear Admiral Tim Gordet, he is a private consultant and host of the American Blue Economy podcast. He recently served for four years as the Assistant Secretary in, uh, in the National Oceani Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Prior to that, he served for 32 years in the U.S. Navy, completing his career as the oceanographer of the Navy. The floor is yours, Admiral. Thank you, Sterla. It's great to be here. And I have many close friends who are members of the Explorers Club, so it's a real honor uh, to be here tonight with you. And I want to thank you for tolerating my background here. I'm with my family. Uh, we're driving actually down to St. Augustine, Florida to see some friends. But uh, today was, after six days, uh, the moment when the motor vessel ever given was finally freed and floated off the eastern side of the Suez Canal. The ship ran aground last Tuesday while maneuvering in 50 knot winds and very poor visibility due to a dust storm. Uh, they had to move 200,000 tons of sand uh, off her bow, uh, which is the equivalent of eight Olympic swimming pools full of, of earth. Uh, so it was kind of quite a monumental achievement. Now, a little bit about the MV Ever Given. Uh, this the container ship uh, was has some similarities and differences to the, one of the ships that I was a deck watch officer on in the Navy. It was the USS Kitty Hawk, which is a, a Navy aircraft carrier. So consider this. The displacement of the Ever Given was 224,000 tons. Believe it or not, that is double the displacement of the aircraft carrier I served on. Uh, the ship's length was 400 meters or about 1,300 feet. My aircraft carrier was just about 1,000 feet, so over a third as big as it's my ship. And then uh, it, it carried 20,000 containers compared to what we were carrying, which was a whole different set of cargo, 70 aircraft, and high performance attack jets. Uh, but the interesting thing about the Ever Given, uh, it appears to be, you know, a monument to heavy industry, but it actually also has incredibly precise electronics. And that ship can, can maneuver within inches of its desired position. So it's a state of the art ship built in 2018. Now, a couple of comments about the incident. Sandstorms are indeed hazards to navigation. I have seen that firsthand in the Arabian Gulf uh, during the Iraq campaign, uh, where my aircraft carrier uh, maneuvered in the Arabian Gulf and in the Arabian Sea uh, during the first strikes into Afghanistan after 9-11. And this sandstorm was well forecast. In fact, uh, the Suez Canal Authority leads ships in all types of conditions fog, rain, sandstorms, you name it. And in 2020, uh, the Suez Canal Authority pushed 19,000 ships through the canal. That's 51 ships a day without incident. So they're really well proven in this. And this, this event is a, a definitely an anomaly. In fact, before it, it was only war that had caused the canal to be closed or blocked. Uh, and that was, a, for example, the 1956 to 57 Arab-Israeli War. So investigation is going to go on for probably weeks to months, and we'll really find out the real story there. But I have a little bit of intelligence, which is kind of interesting. Uh, my wife, Karen, who's driving the car right now, uh, was also a Naval Academy graduate like me, and her classmate was an Egyptian Naval cadet who became an officer and is now one of the pilots in the Suez Canal. 
And in her contact with him, we found out that one of the major causes probably of this incident was that there was a language barrier between the Arabic pilot and the Chinese crew in the bridge of the ship. And what the ship did is when they got a rudder order to compensate for the, the excessive winds coming off the starboard side, uh, they think they get used too much rudder. And that would drove her into the uh, side of the canal. Uh, but we'll find that out. Ultimately, the impact was significant. The canal sees 1.2 billion tons of cargo through every year, and that's 12% of world trade. So any given day, $10 billion of trade go through the, the canal. Think about this. When a U.S. seaport closes, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, like Houston, because of a hurricane, that's about $100 million a day of economic impacts. Here, $10 billion a day, very significant. And about 300 ships had to wait uh, for this canal to be cleared. And, and that, about two dozen actually went and rerouted around Africa, which incurred about 10 to 12 extra days of navigation, 38,000 miles, a risk of piracy, and $26,000 a day of fuel costs. So it's a big decision for shippers to do this. Of the 300 ships that were waiting, 400 were container ships. And of those 15 had destinations in US seaports. And, and some of the ports affected were uh, ports of New York, New Jersey, Baltimore, Norfolk, Charleston, Savannah, Miami, and Houston. And these are all ports that Americans all across the country depend upon. Take the port of Savannah, for example, which I just passed. Uh, that, that ship has a supply chain that reaches deep into the Midwest, and it's the nation's gateway for U.S. containerized agriculture exports. So this interruption was significant, and it only exacerbates a, a big impact on our global supply chain that's been disrupted by the coronavirus. So a couple of final points. This just demonstrates that global shipping is indeed the lifeblood of the global system. And it illustrates also the importance of the, the strategic choke points like the Suez Canal. It may include the Panama Canal, the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb on the bottom part of the Red Sea, the Strait of Hormuz, and the Straits of Malacca. And marine transportation is a key component of America's blue economy, which is that part of our economy, the large part of it, that is dependent upon our oceans coast and Great Lakes. And when I was in charge of NOAA, I led an initiative to advance our American blue economy, which has seen activity grow on the order of 400% in the last 25 years. And just in 2018 alone, we saw $5.4 trillion of economic activity in U.S. seaports alone. That was a third of U.S. GDP. So the U.S. is an ocean economy. And, uh, you know, I think Anna's going to share with you all that I'm starting a monthly broadcast on the American uh, Blue Economy, and it's going to be on the uh, the American Shoreline Podcast Network. Write that down, and we're going to talk about all the sectors of the blue economy: tourism, recreation, exploration, mapping, transportation, and uh, coastal resilience. So it's going to be a really exciting segment uh, with with really a rock star lineup that uh, I think Anne is going to share in the chat. And and the point is this: really, that the American Blue Economy is going to be key to our post-pandemic economic recovery. And if you want to read more, I have an article in Real Clear Science that was posted on March 13, 2021. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Just hold on one sec. We have Starla rejoining. I'm sure you can hear me now. Yeah, you're all set, Sir. Okay, great. And uh, my apologies there for disappearing for just a second. Um, I won't be able to say thank you to, to Tim, but uh, I hope we can be able to have him back on at the Explorers Club at another time. And um, what we're going to do now, first, I'd like to introduce Neil, and he'll talk for about 30 minutes. And after that, um, Lawrence, you will also talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have the Q&A with both authors afterwards. And, uh, and for Neil, um, he is a distinguished professor of archaeology at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. He has been researching, teaching, and writing on the Vikings for nearly 35 years, traveling to more than 40 countries. And he's the author of several books and is a frequent consult consultant and contributor to TV and film. Please, Neil, welcome here. 
Thanks, Stella, and good evening, everyone, or good morning for me. It's uh, it's a great honor to talk to you tonight, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm just going to start sharing my PowerPoint. And I hope you can all see that. Yep. Okay, I think pretty much everybody has some kind of idea about the Vikings. And it probably looks something like this. It's violent, it's maritime, and it's male. And there's a lot of truth in that, but there's an awful lot more to the Vikings than this kind of stereotype. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this evening. The Viking world, the Viking diaspora, was absolutely vast. We're talking about a 300 year period from about 750 to 1050. And this, this map you see now, this is one of the latest that's been made, but it's not big enough. You can expand this in all the directions of the red arrows. So you've got the Scandinavian peoples moving out of the north into the territories of 37 present day countries and coming into contact with over 50 contemporary cultures. So the Viking diaspora is absolutely huge. And a lot of people have written about it. You can, you know, the bookshops are full of books, um, most of them called The Vikings. And the ones that are not called that are called The Viking This or The Viking That. And I'm not criticizing because I've written some of those. But what they all have in common is that they tend to project the Vikings as other people saw them. The view of the Vikings from those on the receiving end of usually very bad things. And what I want to talk about this evening is instead of viewing the Vikings from their victims perspective, we should maybe try to see them as they saw themselves to go inside the Viking mind. So the Viking world from the inside looking out. And that's what I tried to do in um, the book that's, that Stola mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, Children of Ash and Elm, a History of the Vikings. And what I'm going to do this evening is try and give you a very broad 30 minute tour of its themes. And if there's one single point that I want to try and get across this evening, one takeaway in all of this, it's quite simple. The people of the Viking Age were individuals as complicated in every way as we are. And for me, the only question after that is why would, an, why would anyone imagine that they were not? So what I want to do is to try and restore the sophistication, the subtlety to a culture that's often perceived as being rather crude, uh, rather, rather sort of barbarian. And I'm gonna do this in, in several kind of several ways. And I'm gonna begin at the beginning by talking about how the Vikings um, sort of conceived of the origins of everything, including the origins of us, the origins of themselves. So we're going to start off with their place in the worlds um, and, and then go on to look at who they shared them with and then what they did in, in our world. So we'll start off with a, a, a terrible word for a, a, a presentation like this, Gnungagap. This is the yawning void, the beginning of everything, a sort of enormous absence, but nonetheless filled with power. This is the, the kind of the primal emptiness of the Norse cosmos. And at its borders are two realms of ice and fire. It sounds like a fancy novel, doesn't it? Called Niflheim and Muspelsheim. And those two elements, the cold and the heat, mix and they boil and churn as mist in that emptiness, alternately thawing and freezing. And it's out of that sort of glop in the middle that the very first beings in the universe begin to form. And they're, they're very different from each other. There is the first giant called Umir, a frost giant, who sort of coalesces from the mist. 
And then, this is one of the, the weirdest things in any global mythology, the great cow, her name is Althumla. It means uh, the hornless one with lots of milk. And as cows do, she likes to lick the salty rime that forms on the ice in the middle of Ginunga Gap. And as she licks this ice under her tongue, figures are revealed inside those blocks of ice and they're the gods. So the first gods emerge under the tongue of the great cow. And from all of this, and you'll appreciate this is the kind of condensed version because we could go on for hours about Norse mythology. It's fantastic, but we'll just limit it here. From all of this, the worlds are then shaped throughout the cosmos. As more and more beings come into, come into to life, um, they start to construct the worlds. You have the gods in two families, the Aesir and the Vanir, in Ausgartha, Asgard, the giants in Jotunheim, the powers of darkness and evil, all lots of horrible things, in Utgartha, the place outside the boundaries. There are the dead in Hel, and nine levels of Niflhel, Mist Hell, below them. Holding it all together is Yggdrasil, the world tree, and you've got it here in three different versions. On the left, you've got a contemporary Viking Age tapestry that seems to show the tree growing out of the antlers of some kind of animal, um, so very much a part of nature. The manuscript illustration in the middle is an Icelandic um, 17th century version of Yggdrasil, and the current thinking is that the, the kind of origin of this is the Milky Way. If you've ever been fortunate enough to see the night sky without the night, the light pollution of our cities, if you imagine that the Milky Way, this cloudy sort of bar stretching across the heavens, it's not hard to see how that could be um, the origins of this tree holding the universe together. And in the middle of these worlds is our world, Mithgather, Midgard, the middle place. If you like Tolkien, it's the origins of Tolkien's Middle Earth, the world of humans. And it's here that humanity comes into being. On a beach. This is the beach at the edge of the world ocean. It's empty. There are no humans in this world yet. And three gods go walking on those sands. It's Odin. You've heard of him and his two brothers. They walk along the beach and they see two stumps of driftwood that are washed up on the shore. And just like um, the gods inside the blocks of ice, they see features, figures inside those stumps of wood and they start to reveal them. They break the wood apart, they mold it. And gradually two figures inside emerge and the gods give them breath and movement and sight and sense and speech. And their names, named after the wood, Asker, Ash, the first man, and Embla, Elm, the first woman. And if you go beyond the Viking stereotype, these are Vikings that we, we know and love, what you find is something very different. This is a quote from my book that I mentioned earlier. For all the fearful confusion about their identity among those they encountered in the Vikings' own minds, there was never any doubt at all. They were the children of Ash and the children of Elm. So this is the very first human couple from whom everyone else um, eventually is descended. There's also something else about the Vikings that is very much against the stereotype, quite a surprising thing. How the Vikings conceived each individual to be put together. Everyone had something called a hamar. It means something like shape or shell. We call it the body. It's a container with all the other things inside it. But um, crucially, unlike our bodies, these Viking harma could move, they could shift. Um, it's where we get the idea of shape shifting. Some people, not everyone, but some people could change their bodies into other forms. Inside your harma, every Viking Age person had a huger, 
This is something like the mind or personality. It's who you really are without any, um, any artifice or, or pretense. It's the absolute essence of you. And then a third soul being. This is my favorite one, actually. It's, it's, it's quite, quite remarkable. The Hamingja. This is your luck. Luck is a really important thing in the Viking world. But these luck beings, the Hamingjur, they're actually physical, um, physical creatures that can leave you. They can walk about. Um, people with the right abilities can actually see them. There are these amazing descriptions of battles where somebody sees that the opposing side has an awful lot of luck spirits with them and thinks, hmm, maybe not such a good idea to fight them today. We talk about your luck running out. That's actually a concept that goes back to the Viking Age. And that it meant it was meant literally because your Hamminger could get fed up with you and leave. And that was very bad news. And then finally, there's the Fulger, the follower. And this is a spirit that's inherited in lines of families. It, it comes down through your family line. Um, it lives inside you. It's a kind of a kind of guardian spirit. It looks after you. It will appear to you in dreams and give you advice, try and help you if it can. And these fulgur, this is the interesting part, they're always female, even for men. So think of those stereotypical Vikings on their longship in that picture I showed you at the beginning. Inside each of those Viking warriors is a spirit woman helping him, guiding him, looking after him. And I've got to say, we don't really know what any of these things look like. We find in the archaeology dozens of little figurines like this, often female with these long sweeping dresses and, and sort of plaited hairstyles. There's what seems to be a male figure in there as well. You can see him with a, an axe and a sword. We don't know whether these are meant to be humans or gods and goddesses, or maybe these are what the Huger, the Hamminger, the Fulger looked like. But these complicated Viking humans were not alone in the world. They shared it with an invisible population. Um, and I've put this, this rather sort of ridiculous label here, non-real reality, because although we might classify these things as the supernatural to the Vikings, they were not only natural, they were real. A world of elves and dwarves, of a different kind of guardian ancestor called Desir, of spirits, of the land, of the air, the water, the rock, the ice, and then things that still populate world folklore today, trolls um, and other kinds of nasty spirits of the wild. And even in some of the, the realms of the Viking cosmos that I've mentioned, like Asgard, that you've probably heard of, I mean, Marvel films, if nothing else, Valhalla, there's a lot more to the realm of the gods and the Viking afterlife than that. We think of Valhalla as being the home of Odin where Viking warriors go when they die, but actually most of the gods had their own halls. So these rather complicated names, these are the names of some of the halls that we know about and the gods in brackets afterwards are the ones that live in them. The one in red, Valhalla, that's the original word for Valhalla. Odin has three halls, but Asgard is not just one great hall of the gods. It's a whole landscape dotted with estates and manor houses uh, for the gods to live in. There are other afterlives as well. There's one under the sea, an underwater afterlife for people who drown. They go down to the halls of the god Aegir and his wife Raun. There's a special afterlife for the enslaved with Thor. Lots and lots of different variants. There's also even um, in, the, in the sagas and, and in the archaeology even a, a kind of personal afterlife, especially in Iceland. There are several places called Helgefjell. It means holy mountain. This is one of them, not too far from Reykjavik, providing a kind of personal family afterlife. There are descriptions of the leading families of districts. Rather strange description. They, they die into mountains like this. And every now and then they open up and you can see inside a sort of um, eternal party just for your family. It shows the importance of ancestors. Not everyone is an ancestor, only special people among the dead, kind of role models for the living, perhaps also role models for the dead. 
and connecting all of these things, all of the worlds and the different beings that populate them, the worlds of the living, the worlds of the dead, the afterlife, is magic. Magic as a kind of conduit to all those other worlds, um, carried out by special people for special purposes. They're the people that can tease apart the seams of reality and cross between the worlds. And the people who, above all, worked with this special kind of sorcery are women. It's very much a realm of female power. And what you can see on the screen here are just a few of many, many items that come from the burials of people we think are sorceresses. It's a reconstruction of one there with um, special kinds of ointments in pots, with hallucinogenic drugs, um, with metal staffs, you can see two of them there that we think they're used to, to wind back their soul when they send their soul out on, on missions, things like that. So all held together by magic. That's kind of the mythological background, but what about the, the, the more famous Viking age, the Viking age of raiding and trading and colonizing and so on? A lot of Viking history books start the Viking Age, this artificial time period, here on this beach, just below the monastery of, Northum of Lindisfarne in Northumbria in England. It's the site of the first textually recorded Viking raid, 7th of June, 793, when a few boatloads of Norwegians turned up on this beach and um, chased the, the English and frightened the clergy and gave the monks of Lindisfarne a very bad day. But actually, the first archaeologically recorded Viking raid is nearly four decades earlier. This is another beach, um, quite a long way away, in Estonia, in the Baltic, on a place called Salma, at the, uh, the island of Sarama. And here, not too long ago, the early 2000s, excavations re revealed an extraordinary thing. Two boat graves containing a staggering total of 41 heavily armed men, many of them with very severe weapon injuries. Lots of complex rituals. Um, the bodies are buried in a pile. If you can see my cursor, that's this circle of bodies here. You can see the outline of the largest ship. A very complex set of rituals, including a mound of shields over those bodies, the mass killing of birds and fish and dogs, and even the possible presence of a king in the middle of that mound. And stable isotope analysis of these, these guys' teeth reveals that they came from Sweden. It's a Sweden, Swedish raiding party that seems to have come to grief on an Estonian island. This pushes us back beyond the traditional Viking Age, and it's clear that Scandinavian links with Europe and the East go back millennia. There are active trading and import connections ultimately with the overland and maritime silk roads, not just in the Viking Age, but in the preceding centuries, perhaps as far back as the 500s. So what we call the long late Iron Age is very long indeed. And I think if we look for the origins of the Vikings, we really have to go to the, the slow Scandinavian recovery from the economic disruption that set in as the Roman Empire was declining discontinuities in production and trade, political instability, war, environmental downturns. There seems to have been sometime in the 500s, a pretty clear break with an earlier way of life and the beginnings of something new. So from that period of instability, a kind of new world took shape in Scandinavia on the eve of the Viking Age. And this is the rise of um, rather natty dressers like this, the, the warlord culture of the North and the hall system that sustained them. And we're now talking about the two centuries or so before that raid on Salma, before the start of the Viking Age. It's a highly militarized society. It's very aggressive. It's expansionist. It expresses its power in monumental landscapes. The one you see on the screen here is Gamla Uppsala, old Uppsala, just down the road from where I am now, expressed in the form of enormous royal halls, palaces, basically, and monumental burial mounds. And all of this is kept in place by a retinue, a war band, and it's paid for by long distance commerce, all the building blocks of the Viking Age. And what holds this together into the Viking Age itself 
is the most basic level of family life. This is the social cement of Viking Age Scandinavia. It's the bonds of kinship, of family over many generations, and also bonds of alliance, political alliance between families, who you marry, who you associate with. There's even a special, very formal kind of friendship, which again ties families and individuals together. We can trace this in the archaeology in all kinds of ways, beginning with the smallest members of those families. Um, Viking Age children, they're not, not really what you think of when we think of the Vikings, but there's some marvellous evidence of their lives. Lots and lots of toys, little toy boats, very fitting for the Vikings. Toy animals, you can see a, a horse here, a, a duck. Um, musical instruments, these, these um, bones that you spin to make a whirring noise. And my favourite in the bottom right here is, this is a, a replica from, from fragments that have been found. This is the earliest children's furniture known from Europe. And those of you who have small children or have had toddlers in your home, you can see that you can put a, a little Viking in this chair. There's a rod that slides across the front to stop him or her from getting out. It's a very recognisable kind of thing. We know that teenagers were clearly present with the Viking raiding parties, with the armies. Occasionally they were buried at co as combatants at places like Repton in Derbyshire in, in Britain. This is a mass grave from an army, even at Selma. This is one from the, the Repton winter camp, uh, dated 873. DNA confirms that these two people are father and son. And boys in particular were, were kind of fitted into this mindset of warriorhood from a young age. And children would have been an obvious part of that mobile world of the diaspora. We find lots of little miniature weapons um, scaled down for tiny Viking hands. But you can even divide these swords into the same exact types, the same shapes as the adult ones with the blades that they weren't supposed to touch. In other words, little Viking boys and girls wanted to have swords exactly the same as their parents. Viking Age Scandinavia was a patriarchy, um, but one in which women had their own spheres of influence and power. There were very well-defined social expectations of men and of women. But also maybe a kind of fluidity of identity. Some of you may remember a few years ago, um, the internet got very excited about a find of uh, a female Viking warrior in Birka. I was one of the people um, working and publishing that. Uh, so not just the classic um, Viking woman that you see on the on the left with her her oval brooches and 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 wonderful clothing and so on, but uh, possibility of different kinds of lives, not just for women, for men as well, um, a different way of moving through the world, and we can see this in the archaeology too, where we have these little figurines of what seem to be um, armed women. There's also a different kind of life in the Viking Age at the very lowest end of the social scale, because this is very much a slave society. Thralls um, kept the Viking economy going. We know a terminology of slavery from the later law codes, um, specific terms for, for male and female enslaved people, um, those of them who, who were put to work in bakeries, in weaving sheds, as um, servants in the household, um, managing the farm. So very much a, an unequal society. If we try to sum up the factors behind why and how the Viking Age began, there isn't a single cause. I think there is a logical extension of lots of gradual processes that were set into motion centuries earlier. In effect, the raids, the famous raids, are outward projections of behavior that have been going on inside Scandinavia for centuries. And the same is true for the trade and long distance travel, except instead of all this coming to the north, as they've done before, now the Scandinavians went to the sources themselves. And I think there's an initial focus in all of this on the Baltic and the east, remember that, that raid on the island near Estonia, rather than as tradition has it in the West. This is also where we run into modern politics, because even when I started studying the Vikings in the, in the 1980s, this was still a world, a research world, shaped by the Cold War. 
the Iron Curtain was an absolute barrier to scholarship. There was an Eastern Viking Age and a Western Viking Age, and they really didn't meet very much in our books. Today, those notions are increasingly irrelevant. It was the same individuals traveling long distances right across that diaspora, the map I showed you at the beginning, all the way ultimately from the Eastern seaboard of North America to the Asian steppe. And we should think about them in the same terms. Just some examples, this is a familiar picture. Um, each of these dots is a Viking raid. The stars are lots of Viking raids. This is why it was a very bad idea to live in southern England or, or France in the 8th and 9th centuries. This is the Viking Age we think of, the raids on the, the English kingdoms and on the Frankish Empire. But even in Europe, Viking operations extended further than that focus. They took in the whole of the Mediterranean. Viking fleets attacked what is now Spain and Portugal, North Africa, Italy. They went to Greece, they went to Turkey, and even, according to a reliable source, even Alexandria and Egypt. We don't imagine Vikings in the delta of the Nile, but we should. They were frequent visitors to the largest city in the world, Constantinople, today's Istanbul. They walked the streets of Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Empire, also one of the great cities. If we go even further east to the Black Sea, the Caucasus, the Sea of Azov, the Caspian, the Aral Sea, um, all these caravan routes to the Caliphate, to the Gulf, to the Steppe, the Silk Roads in short, we find some extraordinary but rather humble monuments even to this. In Sweden, not far from here, um, there is a rune stone, uh, a memorial to the dead, in memory of a man who died at a place called Khawarezm, and that's the red dot on the map. It's an oasis um, in, in what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia. So not only did the Vikings get there, one of them died there and somebody else got back to tell the tale. On this map, and if you see right on the extreme left, that's Sweden, this is the Eastern Baltic. This is the usual world of the Vikings in the East, but we have to extend that, not just to the Byzantine Empire or to the Caliphate of the Arabs, but all the way East um, into the Silk Roads, into what's now Afghanistan, the borders of India, and not forgetting a key Arab text from the 870s, which actually describes the Vikings as going to China, literally going to China. What's going the other way? This, silver. There's nearly a million silver dirhams, silver coins from the Arab world that have been found in Viking Age hordes from Scandinavia and the Southern Baltic. They represent only the tiniest fraction of the true scale of this trade. Various things went the other way. Um, furs, falcons, very expensive things, um, honey, things like that. But above all, people we've met before, slaves. This is an intricate and pretty ugly system. All the other aspects of this, Viking economics, the critical economics of ships. We all know what Viking ships look like but you need the wool to make the sails, which requires sheep rearing on a massive scale. You need tar for sealing those sails and also the, the, the corking of the planks themselves. Large scale industries in the outlands. You need woodland management for all that timber on a long term, large scale. You need iron for the rivets and the other components and all the labor to make that textile workers, metal workers, wood workers. Just some statistics to get your head round. It would have taken a year's work for 10 people to build a warship. It would have taken a year's work for 30 people to outfit that ship with sails and rigging and to make sea clothes for its crew. By the 10th century, Viking fleet sizes of 200 ships or, or more are common in the European campaigns. By the early 11th century, the sailcloth requirements of Norway and Denmark alone would have taken the annual production of two million sheep. This again 
is a different Viking world, a, a world of farmers um, who nonetheless are, are feeding in to that enormous expansion across the globe. We're moving towards the end now of the, of the time I've got, but what I've tried to sort of convey to you is a Viking age with deep roots much further back in the northern past. A Viking age that had lots of causes, a Viking age that was very varied, a world in constant change, and a Viking age seen on its own terms from the inside rather than the outside. A Viking age of all conditions of humanity, a Viking age that acknowledged, I think, diversity and difference and worldviews very alien to our own. Think about that cosmic cow, think about ash and elm. Not just alien to us, but alien to their contemporaries as well. So the Viking age as, <clears throat> excuse me, as the complicated heritage of the North, complex people in a complex place, a complex history with complex legacies. So there is all that violence and brutality and oppression and horror that the Viking stereotype gives us. But there's also a variation in attitude and behavior. There's a resilience and there's also a subtlety, a sophistication, a certain play of mind that's very characteristic for Viking civilization. So I'm going to leave you with two views of the Viking Age. One is a Viking epitaph. Uh, uh, an inscription on a runestone, it's my favorite runestone, um, wonderful thing with this, this glorious face mask carved onto it. Um, it's a runestone in which reality plays to stereotype. It comes from the 10th century from Aarhus in Denmark with a really Viking um, send off. Gunulfur and Urgotter and Aslaker and Rolfe set up this stone in memory of Fuller, their comrade in arms. He found death when kings were fighting. It's a classic stone in that it pays just as much attention to the people who are putting it up as to the person being commemorated. It tells you, tells us who they are, their comrade in arms. So all of these men are warriors. And Fula, the man the stone is for, went out in a proper Viking way when kings were fighting. But there are other kinds of Vikings too. This is a runestone from Sweden, not far from where I'm, where I'm here. It's actually lost. It was, it was dug up to make a road in the 1600s, but somebody drew it before that, a different kind of Viking life. This is put up not only for a woman, but by a woman in memory of herself while she's still alive. Ingirun, Harvard's daughter, had these runes carved for herself. She wants to travel east and abroad to Jerusalem. Fotter carved the runes. So maybe she doesn't intend to come back. Maybe she's settling out there, but she puts this as a, an, a statement of intent and a statement of who she is. That's what I have time for this evening. Um, if you'd like to make, know more about any of this, um, to the tune of 600 pages, you lucky people, um, the book I mentioned earlier, Children of Ash and Elm. You see why I called it that with this view of the Vikings as they saw themselves. Um, lots of illustrations and so on. So um, trying to give you a, a sort of in-depth view of that Viking world. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'm very happy to take questions at the end after Lawrence's talk. So thank you. And I'll stop sharing my PowerPoint. All right. Thank you, Neil. That was fascinating. And if you'll just stay on now, as you mentioned, I'll introduce uh, Lawrence here. So Lawrence Bergwin is an award-winning biographer, an historian and chronicler of exploration. His books have been translated into 25 languages. He's a fellow of the Explorers Club and lives in New York City. Lawrence, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sterla. I'm glad to be here with everybody in the Explorers Club and other places around the world and to talk with you about uh, Francis Drake. Um, these days, uh, this is my 12th book. I tend to write about exploration and discovery and um, especially the effect on history and individuals. It's a 
great way to get to know uh, history through the acts of individuals, which do make a cr critical difference. Uh, Francis Drake is considered the greatest English navigator before the 18th century uh, and figures like Nelson. Um, and he was an extraordinary figure who, as I'll explain, circumnavigated the world successfully and uh, also uh, had played a key role in the Battle of the Spanish Armada, which um, was uh, very important for the establishment of the British Empire. It's not even clear there would have been a British Empire um, if it hadn't been for Sir Francis Drake. So let me just tell you a little bit about his background. Um, he came from, he was the oldest of 12 children. He came from a very modest uh, farming family in Devon, in the south of England. Um, he went to sea because there was nothing else to do. It was an incredibly uh, dangerous uh, profession. Many of his siblings perished at sea, um, but he was a very skillful navigator and uh, he had a lot of success with it. Um, he started off uh, as a commercial mariner and, and it's a small time uh, way. And then later on became a slaver. We don't really associate England uh, with slavery in the same way that we do uh, uh, Spain or Portugal. Uh, but for a while, English, England had a, uh, a slave trade um, and it was spearheaded by his cousin, John Hawkins, who hired him. This was certainly the most disreputable part of Francis Drake's career by far. Um, he followed uh, Hawkins down to um, Central and South America, um, had skirmishes with the Spanish um, over slaves and uh, narrowly escaped with his life and, and made it back to England. And after that, swore off slavery. It's not so much for humanitarian reasons. He thought it was bad business. And uh, it, it seemed to him that must be a better way to make money. And um, he wanted to be a pirate, which seemed to be a step up in the world. Um, and by pirate, he meant stealing gold and silver from Spain rather than slaves and bringing them to England. Drake's England is not the Elizabethan England with Queen Elizabeth that we think of as a thriving, prosperous place, especially in the early years. It was impoverished. People were starving. Um, it was an outcast almost among European countries. Uh, they had one colony in Calais, which they eventually lost, and uh, they were struggling for survival. The 600-pound um, gorilla in the field at that point was Spain. Uh, Spain had the world's largest empire. We all know the expression, the sun never sits on the British empire. But the expression in those days, the original expression was, the sun never sets on the Spanish empire. Because the Spanish empire was huge and it was prosperous. It made Spain the richest country in Europe. And also it was allied with the Catholic church. So it was a formidable obstacle. It seemed like they were on the verge of overrunning England at any time, conquering England and annexing it and making it in some way part of Spain. Uh, England at that point was very divided uh, between Protestant and um, Catholic population. Uh, so it wouldn't have been a stretch to imagine that happening. Um, Spain kept going though, uh, in its own way and rather impractically, they kept harvesting gold and silver and spending it not on their own people, but on the expansion of empire um, in foreign countries, in France uh, and other countries. So Spain itself, the Spanish people were not really prospering. The person who was running all this was King Philip. Uh, King Philip had been, uh, married a number of times. Um, he was extremely powerful. And the older he got, the more reclusive he got. Um, he uh, basically hid out in his giant castle all the time and tracked his empire from his tabletop, from his desktop. He was not really an active participant. He was very pious. Um, he followed uh, the, the teachings of the Catholic Church very carefully. Um, and uh, but he was, was not really, um, he was not a people person. Let's put it that way. Um, unlike Elizabeth, Elizabeth, um, as is well known, uh, it was a very improbable story that she even became Queen of England in the first, first place, um, Mary Queen of Scots, 
Um, her older half sister, who was Catholic, uh, seemed destined for that role, but she died young. Um, keep in mind that Queen Elizabeth's mother was Anne Boleyn, and her father was King Henry VIII, who executed Anne Boleyn. So her beginnings were traumatic, violent, and bloody. Um, she was not in the line of succession. She grew up as a recluse, uh, and um, but also very scholarly, very smart, and um, realized that every day her survival was at stake. Uh, through a series of historical accidents, when she became queen at the age of 25, this seemed to herald a new age in England. In some ways, she was, she was a master of two things, of compromise and deception. Compromise, for example, in the religious area um, by combining both Catholic and Protestant traditions. Uh, nominally, she was a Protestant, but if you were to attend a service, an official service, uh, that that uh, she uh, was there, you would think this this looked Catholic, and uh, certainly her inauguration looked Catholic. Nevertheless, uh, she considered herself Protestant. Um, she was also, as she got older, became a very practiced liar. This was a Machiavellian skill that she needed to survive because she was surrounded by people who wanted to steal the throne from her at any time. Uh, she survived at least 14 assassination attempts uh, during her reign. Um, it became more dangerous as, it, as time went on, went on because uh, gun makers uh, were learning how to make ever smaller weapons, which meant that could be easily concealed. Um, so it uh, was a minor miracle that she even finished her reign, which, which she eventually did. Um, she really wasn't thinking about an empire at that point. She was thinking about survival. Uh, she didn't want to get married because if she did, she would immediately lose um, her pride of place and her power. Her husband would then become the important figure and uh, she would cede power. And she had seen what had happened over and over um, in her early years. So she never married. She was called the Virgin Queen. Whether she was literally a Virgin Queen, not, not so likely. Um, she had uh, several uh, important romances during her, her life, usually drawn from the highest echelons of the aristocracy. In Brazil, she clearly liked men. Uh, she had uh, men who came to visit her uh, late at night. And, uh, you know, she had a uh, kind of a normal hunger for human company. Um, she also had uh, uh, some special um, circumstances when she was younger. Uh, she suffered smallpox, which was common, and that left her with a deformity, uh, severe pockmarks in her face, which she disguised throughout her life uh, with heavy white makeup. And uh, also in those days, Elizabethan uh, hygiene wasn't so great. Um, the aristocracy bathed frequently, which meant once a month. Um, other people, perhaps once a year. Uh, they disguised the pungent body odors with perfume sachets that they sewed into their clothes. Um, they didn't have toothbrushes. Their teeth tended to rot and fall out of their heads. Uh, so if you were to look at them up close uh, under a magnifying glass, uh, they would not seem like perhaps like perfect spec specimens. Um, anyway, that was the, the era that she grew up in. Uh, but as I mentioned before, she was highly intelligent and intellectually accomplished. And in her court, there were some interesting figures. There was Sir John, Haw there was John Hawkins, um, I'm sorry, Francis Walsingham who was a Puritan um, who was the inventor of the British Secret Service and spies, and she relied heavily on spies for preservation. Um, and another important figure in her court who was kind of an oddball was Sir John D. D-E-E. -E. He was a figure straight out of Harry Potter. Now I'd like to turn to the uh, PowerPoint and uh, if Kevin is there and uh, we'll, 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 I'll show some pictures of some of these uh, figures that I'm talking about. So if we could uh, go to the next uh, slide, please. And that's me with, well, in the Strait of Magellan, but we'll keep going to the next slide, please. There I am aboard uh, Drake's ship. We'll come back to this, the Golden Hind, which was a replica in London, but the next slide, please. Um, and Drake's route, we'll come back to the circumnavigation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, and next slide, please. We'll have to come back to some of these. Um, here is Francis Drake himself. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but he was known for his red hair. Queen Elizabeth also had red hair. So we have two redheads who eventually allied. Next slide, please. Here we go. John D um, is the figure in the black cap uh, demonstrating uh, pouring something in a flame. Um, he was the most brilliant mathematician in England at that time. And Queen Elizabeth, who you can see seated on her throne, uh, respected him. Um, he introduced uh, what we consider to be conventional mathematical symbols such as plus and minus and divided sign um, to England, which didn't have it before then. Um, in, in addition to that, he was a mystic. Um, he felt that he could see the ghost world, the spirit world, um, through what he called a scrying stone. That's S-C-R-Y-I-N-G. Actually, he needed someone to help him do it, um, but uh, he had a collection of scrying stones that were little discs, um, often engraved. Uh, they were the size of a, of a large cookie, um, rather heavy because they were made out of metal and um, they were considered very popular. Um, so people took John D uh, just as seriously as an astrologer and mystic as they did as a mathematician. In his spare time, he conceived something he called the British Empire. The term was not known at that time, um, but he saw Britain as being ideally situated in, in, in the globe in the way uh, all the uh, land masses were um, arranged in the globe as being a center or perhaps the central landmass on earth and uh, therefore the center of the British Empire. This was a bold, um, visionary, um, even crazy idea, but uh, he convinced Elizabeth to think about having an empire. The question was how to do it. Um, that meant conquering and traveling by sea. Uh, there were various navigators who were in Elizabeth's employ as pirates. Uh, she didn't back them explicitly. She hid her involvement. Um, she was formed a syndicate. Uh, there were hints and clues that she was involved because the ships would be named Elizabeth or something that, you know, in some way related to her. And um, she, uh, uh, was so working behind the scenes to promote this idea of the British Empire, whether it was Drake or another uh, navigator, it, it didn't much matter. As it turned out, Drake was the one who rose to the occasion. Uh, and his uh, first great event, his first great voyage um, was the circumnavigation, which began in 1577 and uh, lasted three years. And Drake was about 37 years old at that time. There's a lot of discussion about what year he was exactly born in exactly, but we'll say more or less 1540. Um, he set out from England and uh, uh, ostensibly to go to the coast of, of Brazil. And he was going to trade there uh, and bring back um, spices uh, to England or, or gold that he could steal from Spain. Um, he didn't tell the crew what he was going to do, but he kept going and going. And he was following the track of his uh, predecessor, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, who had gone about 60 years earlier. Uh, Magellan's voyage, which was considered the first circumnavigation, was a glorious tragedy. Uh, most of the people died. Magellan himself was killed in a very unnecessary war in, with uh, indigenous people in the Philippines. And perhaps 18 survivors or so made it all the way around the world and back to Spain, not Magellan. Uh, and it was considered so difficult and so onerous and dangerous that uh, nobody wanted to try it again for 60 years. Um, however, Drake um, was extremely courageous and he decided he could benefit from Drake's mistakes and from Magellan's mistakes and do what, uh, do what Magellan had, do correctly what Magellan had done wrong. So the first thing he did was sail south along the coast of South America until he reached what we now call the Strait of Magellan, not that far from the um, uh, Antarctic Circle. Can we get to the slide that shows um, the circum... We better back up the map of the circumnation. Here we go. Now that's down near 
the lowest edge of there. Um, Drake made it all the way down there and uh, uh, in search of, of uh, a way to um, uh, China, um, to the east. And, uh, you know, but, but he, he followed Magellan's route. He had the, made, had the benefit of Magellan's mistakes. Um, when he rounded, um, you, can, you can see there that when he went through the Strait of Magellan, then he headed north and then made his way up the coast um, and uh, ac across the coast of Chile. Along the way, he was raiding Spanish encampments. They, this was very poorly guarded uh, um, uh, caches of gold and silver. So he was filling up his ships with a fortune in precious metals. Um, he was uh, uh, alar raised alarms in Spain. He was called El Draque, the dragon. Um, he acquired in a fearsome reputation as having almost supernatural powers, um, actually more of a reputation in Spain than he did in England be because of his activities. Um, and he kept going. He was fearless. However, he was also very careful. He rarely went on shore because he would have been in danger uh, the second he did. So while he stayed offshore, uh, raiding parties uh, would um, uh, uh, steal gold and scamper back to the ships. When he did encounter Spanish ships at sea, he was bilingual. He, he spoke Spanish well. Um, he would speak to the captains in their own language and he was very cheerful and uh, he happily raided them. Um, one of his most famous escapades occurred um, off the coast of uh, um, Chile when he encountered a ship called Cacafuego, um, at Shitfire, and it was loaded with precious gems. Um, he relieved the ship of uh, you know, their precious cargo, uh, and it was considered the greatest haul of any uh, pirate at that time. Uh, so that alone was enough to make his reputation. And, and yet he kept going on the circumnavigation. And by the way, back in England, nobody knew how far he was going. Um, there was no communication. So uh, occasionally word got back uh, to Europe that you know, there had been a sighting of Drake, but nobody really knew if he was alive or dead um, or when to expect him or if he would ever return. So, you know, England was in the dark, in other words, about his escapades. Meanwhile, Drake and his uh, band of uh, uh, sailors uh, kept on sailing. Uh, they they um, were uh, skillful, but keep in mind, um, they also had some vulnerabilities. They didn't know how to swim, uh, incredibly enough. And they uh, uh, were at the mercy of storms um, and... Uh, also any kind of people whom they encountered. Um, along the way, the Spanish had traumatized any number of uh, indigenous people. And when they saw other Europeans, i.e. Drake's men, they assumed that they were like the Spanish and they attacked them. It was only when Drake got further north, all the way along uh, the coast of North America, um, up to California, um, that he encountered people who had not been uh, traumatized by the Spanish. And the reaction was telling. It was totally different. They welcomed him. Uh, he was uh, treated much better. Um, he was out of, you know, felt he was out of danger. Although he was still careful. He still stayed offshore and uh, um, practiced the same uh, cautious approach. Um, but the, the apotheosis of this latter part of the voyage occurred when he reached um, uh, Washington State and the Miwok Indians. Uh, the Miwok, and there are just a few hundred of them left today, uh, were very populous throughout the region. And he was fascinated by them and they were fascinated by him. Um, he spent weeks with them, he and his men. Um, he lived with them for a while. Um, they wrote about how the Miwok lived uh, their dwellings uh, and uh, their food. It was often uh, ground acorns. Uh, various members of Drake's voyages, of uh, Drake's voyage, uh, kept journals of, of his accounts, especially uh, Fletch, Francis Fletcher, who was uh, his chaplain. And you get in a, a kind of 
early anthropology anthropological account of what it was like uh, to encounter these Indians in their um, you know, unspoiled state, unspoiled in the sense that they hadn't been uh, corrupted or defiled uh, by the Spanish. Um, they liked Drake so much, interestingly enough, that they wanted him and his men to stay and to become their leader. Um, often we think of Drake as another conquistador. Um, like Magellan or Pizarro or any or others. Uh, but Drake actually uh, had no interest in killing or conquering, unlike, say, Columbus, um, for who, you know, who was and became responsible um, after a slow start for not only hundreds, but thousands of deaths. And uh, Drake uh, was pretty well disposed to these people. He was peaceful. He was curious about them. But he basically just wanted any silver that the or gold that the Spanish could find. As long as he scooped up the silver, he was happy. Um, eventually, he politely refused the offer of the Miwok to become their leader um, and continued on his way. Uh, he was under a delusion that then that he could uh, follow what was known as the Northwest Passage. Um, this was widely believed to be in Europe, um, around Europe, as a shortcut. Uh, that would somehow get him uh, to China and to Asia. It didn't exist. Um, he kept traveling north, further and further north. There's actually some debate about how far he went, but it was quite cold. Um, his men were freezing. And as you can see, he eventually uh, turned west and headed out into the Pacific. Unlike Magellan, Drake had some idea of what he was getting into. Part of Magellan's problem was that he thought the world was much smaller than it actually was about two thirds of its actual size because he didn't realize how big the Pacific was. Um, the Pacific of course is the largest body of water on the planet. We really don't, we call the planet earth, but you know, we really live on the ocean planet. Um, a more accurate title might be ocean. Um, and the Pacific is, as I mentioned, the largest of all. Um, he was helped by the fact that there were strong trade winds that carried him steadily um, east as he went and rapidly. So he, following um, Magellan's example, uh, knew that eventually he would get to uh, Indonesia and the Moluccas and the Spice Islands. Uh, this was considered um, the most desirable place to go for getting gold and silver and trading in Europe. This is why Magellan had gone. By the time Drake had gotten there, he wasn't really that interested. He had already loaded his ship with so much uh, in the way of precious metals, not only gold and silver, but diamonds, uh, that he wasn't uh, particularly interested. Um, he felt he would get a wel welcome reception uh, from the leaders, local leaders there, but he didn't. Uh, perhaps they had been jaded uh, by uh, uh, Magellan's earlier visit. So he, he, just, he eventually just kept on going and going and going and made it back to uh, England about three years after he left. He had departed from Plymouth and returned to Plymouth, um, which was not far from his birthplace. And uh, even then though, um, there was doubt about uh, the success of this voyage. Uh, plague had come to England as it often did. And he had to spend some time offshore uh, before that passed. And of course, he was a marked man when he got back to England because of all this incredibly valuable gold and silver that he was bringing uh, to them. So Elizabeth um, wanted to hide uh, all this material. Um, she, what she did was conceal um, his boats in the Tower of London. And then when anybody asked her about Drake and his voyage and what happened, she said, Drake, oh, right, yes, he came back, yes, yes. And what did he bring with him? Well, nothing special. Did he bring back any gold or silver? And she, she would admit to nothing. And the same with her ministers around her. Nobody talked about Drake's accomplishments. Um, one of the, because they were afraid that uh, he, they would be attacked and they were afraid that this would provoke King Philip into invading England immediately. Uh, one of the curious uh, side effects of this secrecy was that it took some time, about, about eight or 10 years for Drake to win acknowledgement. Uh, for his great accomplishment, because it was accomplished in secret. 
um, the powers that be, and there were just a few of them in England, uh, realized we had what he had done and uh, what a fantastic accomplishment it was. Uh, but it was only when Hacklett wrote the second edition of his account of England's explorers and voyages that the full extent of Drake's circumnavigation uh, finally became known. Uh, this wasn't the end of Drake's career. This was just the begin the end of uh, the first part. And if we uh, look at some more slides quickly here, uh, let's just keep going. Um, and I want to get to Buckland Abbey. Uh, no, 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 keep, just keep going, please. Um, keep going. It's Indian Egypt, keep going, please. Uh, we'll keep going. Um, oh, right, back up. Let's back up to the knighting. I'd like to chat about that a little bit. Uh, when he came back, I had mentioned that Drake was a commoner and rather low born. Um, Queen Elizabeth knighted him, except she didn't, um, according to legend. Uh, she did, and here's a depiction of it. Uh, but again, she was so afraid of reprisal from Spain that at the last minute she handed her sword that she used to tap Drake on either shoulder to knight him to the French ambassador. So the French ambassador stepped in at the last minute, substituted for her, and elevated Drake to knighthood. So from then on, he became Sir Francis Drake. And this made a huge difference in his life. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the big, to begin with, he had this rather spectacular home, Buckland Abbey. This had been a Cistercian Abbey before that. It had been uh, emptied, it had been cleaned out, and he lived here. Um, his first wife, um, with whom he was married for a long time, no children, by the way, um, had died. And he moved here with his second wife, who was an aristocrat. And uh, it was a huge place, big, it was cold, it was dark, it was drafty, but it was very, very impressive. Uh, Drake was now among the wealthiest men in England. Um, he became mayor of Plymouth. He was a member of parliament. Um, he was an, a confidant of, of the queen. And he was uh, certainly a force to be reckoned with. Um, he walked, or I should say, sailed away from all that not long after he received this fantastic gift of Buckland Abbey because he was much happier at sea. And it wasn't long before he was back uh, skirmishing with the Spanish in various engagements, uh, risking his life. Um, and you may ask, why would he do that if he could carry on like the Lord of the realm that he was uh, with his brand new wife? And he was just happier at sea. That was his element. Okay, uh, uh, next, next slide, please. Um, this was a, his second wife, uh, uh, Elizabeth Sydenham. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, uh, well, we'll get to that later. Drake um, uh, was uh, so attracted to the idea of a battle that in 1587, 1589 rather, that's about a little more than a year, nine years after he completed his circumnavigation, he decided to raid the harbor of Cadiz, Spain. Um, this was the famous singeing of the beard of the King of Spain. This was a very daring thing to do because it was virtually asking for Spain to invade England. Um, he didn't care. He went in on a raid. Um, he destroyed many Spanish ships. Um, it was a disaster for Spain. It was a humiliation. And for Drake, it was just the opening sally of a new uh, episode of his attack on Spain. As I mentioned, this had motivated him uh, throughout his career. Um, he then um, returned briefly to England, and England at this point what, realized that Philip at any, any point was going to invade Spain with the huge dreaded Spanish Armada. This was the largest fleet in Europe. Uh, the Spanish ships were huge. They were impressive. They were well manned. Uh, they had a lot of cannon. Um, England, it really did, was still a relatively poor country, did not have an official navy. Maybe, maybe a hundred people, if that. Um, it was basically a merchant marine. Uh, the ships of the English navy, and I have to put that in quotes, um, were, were, it was just a ragtag bunch of um, ships that uh, came together um, to defend England. Uh, they were not uh, gorgeous, embroidered, uh, uh, battleships 
with pennants and you know all sorts of formal decorations like Spain. They were a much more um, put to, uh, uh, scrappy bunch. Um, they were so-called race built, but that did not mean that they were built for races. Um, they were much lower in the water. They were much faster. And actually for battle, they were much better suited than the big cumbersome Spanish ships. Um, when the time came for the Battle of the Spanish Armada, um, which was in the summer, in August of 1580, um, to the surprise of everyone, um, England really had the advantage because their ships were lighter and they were smaller and they were more maneuverable. Uh, not just maneuverable on the water, but their cannon uh, were able to maneuver around their decks. Uh, they were much more nimble. Um, so England won this battle. Now, they were helped along by the fact that this was a year of an LCO, a little climactic optimum. In other words, stormy weather. And that went on for quite some time. And as the ships of the Spanish Armada fled, um, the storm destroyed many of them. And it was, it was a real disaster. Uh, many of the sailors uh, were washed up on the coast of Ireland, of Scotland, as they were as they fled north, uh, trying to get back to Spain in a roundabout uh, sort of way. Um, and uh, it was uh, uh, a complete, it was a complete disaster. It was a humiliation for Spain. This was not the only battle of the Spanish Armada. It was only the first, but it was one that set the tone for all the conflicts that came. Um, Drake had an active role in it. He was not the only uh, admiral who was involved in it. Uh, there were several others who, who played important parts. One curious point part is that in the middle of it, he suddenly disappeared and he had gone off and plundered a ship and was just um, helping himself to all the gold. It, it's as if he had reverted to being a, you know, the pirate that he once was. And he just wanted that gold for himself. And when he finally got it, then he went back into the battle. Um, so anyway, they returned to, uh, the victorious ships returned, but in a curious way, this was sort of a disaster for the victors. Um, the few Spanish survivors who made it back to Spain were well treated uh, by King Philip. Um, Elizabeth let the survivors starve, the ones who made it back to England, uh, the, the English survivors. Uh, there wasn't much money to feed them. Um, the uh, she and her ministers made a cold-blooded calculation that it was cheaper to, to let them starve and let disease kill them aboard ship than to try and pay pensions to their families and uh, their heirs as they were supposed to. So many of these victorious uh, English sailors who had won this glorious victory um, died this ignominious kind of death, really through sheer um, cheapness. I don't know how else to put, to put it. Anyway, officially... Um, England won the Spanish Battle of the Spanish Armada, and Drake, always in search of uh, new battles, sailed off again, fighting now off the coast of Venezuela, um, uh, trying to defeat Spain again and again. Eventually, and he was now getting into his late 50s, um, diphtheria overcame him, and he di died the death of many sailors, which was aboard ship at sea uh, from diphtheria. Um, he was buried at sea in a, in a uh, large uh, metal uh, coffin or enclosure. No one knows exactly where he was buried. Um, and uh, he, he didn't leave any issue. I mentioned he had no children, uh, but they were collateral relatives. Um, and he became, in, in kind of English folklore, you know, a very popular figure uh, because of his uh, general spiritedness. And um, so that's... That's how Drake won his way and battled his way into English history and helped make the British Empire into a reality. That's pretty much the end of my remarks about him. Okay. Okay. That's uh, that's great, uh, Lawrence. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And um, now we're uh, into the Q&A. I see that there are quite a lot of people still watching and uh, it's been quite enjoyable, uh, both of you. And I see Neil is back on also. I have some questions and if there are more questions, please uh, don't hesitate to send them in. I'll start off with uh, a question that came up last now for, for you, Neil. Um, 
it's about uh, the um, uh, the Vikings if they made it as far as China in regards to trade. Um, what types of trade artifacts did you come across in your research that could indicate that Vikings made it as far as China? Uh, the main thing is silk. Um, there are, can you hear me okay? Just a, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the main thing is silk. There are finds of Chinese silks in graves in Sweden, several different examples, um, and in, in Viking towns in Britain. Uh, there's a, a lovely example, uh, which is also one of the, the more extraordinary archaeological coincidences you can think of. There are two silk hats, little sort of caps, um, found one in York and one in Lincoln, two towns in England. And uh, actually, they come from the same bale of silk. They've got a fault in the weave. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this trade with China is very large scale, but somebody gets there. Um, and we also don't know how many sort of middlemen this thing passes through, you know. Um, but there is this one uh, Arab account of um, Viking merchants going to uh, to China, probably to the the far west of China, um, in our terms, but but getting all the way there. And I, and I remember you called it a uh, credible source. Was that right? Yes. Or, yeah, right, yeah, right. I think so. Yeah. And, and also they were in Baghdad, you mentioned. That's also... Yes, yeah. there's, a, there's a source of them going on the, the caravan routes uh, by camel to get to Baghdad. Right, right. And I'll follow up a question from, from Jenny Volkovis, Volkoviski. Uh, what were the driving forces behind the conversion of the Vikings to Christianity? Did this create a rift within Viking ranks and their spirit of conquest? Um, I think the the main uh, the, the main driving force behind the conversion is a top down thing. Um, it's a very early alliance between the incoming Christian Church and the power of Scandinavian kings, and uh, this sort of unification of church and state. And this is the time when the Scandinavian states are, are being created. It's, it's a benefit to both. So the early conversions are really um, Viking kings deciding that, okay, everybody is gonna be Christian. And uh, the, um, there's a big question about how far down into people's lives that really went, whether it's a matter of, um, Sort of performing basic rituals but not necessarily actually believing and it takes many centuries before christianity re really filters through but uh it's certainly present in scandinavia from from the the late 800s um and it, it's you know it's fairly well anchored by by the turn of the uh, the 11th century I, i'm glad it's you that's answering these questions uh, neil and, uh, and i imagine you can see this also with the normans and uh, the way the early Norman settlers would uh, burn down the monasteries, but then it didn't take long until they would uh, figure out how to profit on it in, mm. instead, right? Um, I, I, I got a lot of questions here, so I'll try to move a little bit quick now. Uh, for Lawrence, um, can we quantify in modern money equivalence of what the value of Drake's riches were worth to Queen Elizabeth when he returned from his circumnavigation with stolen Spanish goods? Um, I say it's difficult to do. It's been estimated um, that he brought back the equivalent of 130 million pounds. Um, but it's very hard to figure out a kind of one-to-one -one equivalence. It was a lot of money for England at that time, the most they had ever seen. So it could have been sort of like helped finance some more shipbuilding for it. More shipbuilding, uh, wars, uh, uh, English enterprises overseas, and uh, also just to, to finance the crown. The crown had very little money for their own functioning. So that was okay. probably the first use of it. Thanks, thanks. And then I've got a uh, question for Neil from Marta Shaw. Uh, what inspired you and when to, to delve into this? 
Uh, I've been fascinated by the Vikings since I was a teenager. Um, I started reading the sagas when I was about 15. I've always been interested in archaeology. So I, I was one of those kids that dragged my parents to museums and, and so on from a very young age. And then just when I was at the point of deciding sort of what I wanted to do after school and so on, I, I uh, as I said, I read the sagas and there were also some very influential TV programs on the Vikings and it, they just caught my imagination. Um, they, they also provide a, a wonderful opportunity for travel. You can go to a lot of places when you study the Vikings. So it's, it's not something I've ever regretted. Right, right. And then I, I, I have a uh, follow-up question here um, from Tom Dietz. Um, can you read into the Arsh and Elm story any uh, parallels to other origin stories like the Adam and Eve story? That's a really good question. It's It's clearly a worrying thing that the first couple of Norse mythology have names that begin with A and E. Um, they, they obviously, uh, Adam and Eve are, are not sort of created from trees, but there's still a garden and so on. And there are elements of other mythologies, certainly in uh, Norse mythology, there are, there are elements of Greek and Roman mythology as well. Um, and even this, this realm of the dead, um, it's spelt H-E-L, one L, pronounced heel, but is that something to do with the Christian hell? It's very hard to tell, but but there is some kind of Christian influence. Um, personally, I think the the, the the specifics of the the Ash and Elm story are, are so detailed that they they do derive from a Norse original, but it's it's very hard to tell, and the the, the mythological stories are very contradictory. They're they're all over the place. Actually, it's a mess, but. Uh, it's it's a it's a real challenge to get a sort of coherent narrative from them. Right, right, and and I also had another question earlier on. Um, any coincidence between the start with Odin and his two brothers, and the start uh, with Zeus and his two brothers in Greek mythology? Yeah, there may be. There's also in, in Greek mythology this idea of a primal chaos as well, quite similar to that. Sorry, <clears throat> quite similar to that uh, Genunga gap. Uh, and there's other things like uh, the the Vikings have three women of fate called the Norns who who spin the destinies of human beings, very much like the some figures in in Greek mythology. So I think there is some some classical influence there. Yes. Okay, okay, that's wonderful. And for Lawrence, I have a question for you here. Um, current navigation around south um, is usually down west first and then up to the east side. And uh, is there any reason why Drake went the other way around with the currents? And this is from, uh, from an, a member of the Explorers Club who are, uh, well, she's um, thinking about, consider she's considering navigating around South America and is a little bit confused by going that way after um, cross-checking recent navigation logs. So this is important. Well, we don't really know Drake's route uh, at, in this extreme southern latitude. And there's a lot of discussion about where he was and there are contradictory accounts. So I'm afraid I can't really provide an unequivocal answer to this question. It's a very good question. Um, and uh, you know, it's possible that he went back and forth and we just don't know. They might have uh, fudged their records. In other words, not made them accurate. So we really don't know what he did exactly. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. And I have another question for you as well. Um, would Shakespeare have likely read or known the text of Elizabeth's war speech to her soldiers before the Tilbury battle? Uh, yes, there is a, a kind of overlap between Drake and Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare came along later in uh, the timeline. Um, it's thought that the character of Prospero was inspired by John Dee, for example, the mystic astrologer. And uh, he would have been aware of some of Drake's exploits. Um, he wrote about, especially in The Tempest. Um, so he w was aware of it, but it's, it's not really clear you know, what sources he was drawing on. But yeah, it was it was obviously part of the thinking about the British Empire, the new British Empire at that point. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And since you mentioned John Dee, uh, Rhoda has a question here. Wonderful lecture, um, she writes, impressive information. John Dee, how did he fall foul of Queen Elizabeth and ended up in Prague? Now he died in England, right? But yeah. uh, you've got the question, there you go. 
Well, um, eventually he became disaffected with Elizabeth and Elizabeth was a very difficult prickly person and people fell out with her all the time, sometimes at the you know, cost of their lives. And eventually she had got tired of him. She had a falling out with him. And also it's not clear he was the most stable person um, you know, mentally or emotionally himself. Um, he uh, made common cause with some other mystics and they, they pursue their own ends. So he, he went his own way. You know, his, his shining moment was his invention of this British empire and this, this pamphlet that he uh, published, which, you know, really voiced it and, and expressed it for everyone. Uh, but, but Elizabeth was very difficult to get along with. If uh, Drake had lived longer, he might well have had a falling out with her as well. I guess that's what you get when you're the daughter of uh, Henry VIII. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so um, for Neil, I, I've got another one for you here. It's another right up the alley of uh, historical debates from Piotr. Um, did Vikings establish Zeus as in Russia? There you go. That's a big question. Um, there's no doubt that the the word Russia ultimately comes from that. But the um, the Rus are, are really a very complicated ethnic group. They're not straightforwardly Scandinavians or anybody else, for that matter. It's a it's an ethnicity that grows up around the trade on the eastern rivers, um, a bit like the the fur traders in North America, the Hudson's Bay Company and the, the Voyageur. Um, this idea of a, a, over time it develops into. Uh, a kind of formal idea of a people. And it, it's pretty clear that they call themselves the Rus. There's been some discussion about what it actually means, something to do with rowing ships. Um, and they clearly did play a very significant role in the, the growth of what became the Russian state over many hundreds of years. But by that point, the, the Scandinavian influence in that is, is fairly slight. But um, I, I think there is a strong Scandinavian element in the early Rus, um, really uh, on the on the, uh, the the Dnieper River. This is the one that goes down through 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 Kiev in the Ukraine to the Black Sea, and on the Volga as well. So so yeah, right. I'd, I'd say they, they played a role in that at least. Yes, I, I've got a couple more questions for you, and then we should um, say thanks to each other. Um, first for Lawrence. What brought you uh, to the story of Sir Francis Drake? Well, I've been thinking about it for about 20 years. Um, when I wrote about Magellan's circumnavigation, which was an interest of mine because of a lifelong interest in sailing um, and sailing with my son, who was a competitive sailor. Um, and Drake's voyage was kind of the ultimate voyage. And yet it was a failed voyage. Um, there was Drake looming out there as the person who had uh, managed to accomplish uh, what Drake and Columbus, for that matter, had failed to do. So it seemed inevitable that I would eventually catch up with him um, and write about his exploits. Um, there's a huge amount of documentation in, uh, about what Drake did. Uh, we, we, there's never enough in a way, but it's very well documented. And it's a fascinating period because of the way he intersects with the Elizabethan um, era, you know, at this critical point where it's just beginning to come and become an empire. Right, right. Thanks. And also, um, there's a specific question here. Uh, question for you from Laura. Would you know if the stop in Portsmouth uh, for Drake's uh, circumnavigation is the same spot as where uh, the historic dock is with HMS Victory and Rosemary stands? I'm not familiar with that. I can't okay, remember. okay. Well, thanks anyway, though. And and um, let's see here. I, I have a few, there were quite a lot of Viking questions here, Neil. So I, I will only give you two to uh, to end here now, if that's okay. Um, is it true that the Vikings may have been the first to colonize America? You got the big ones here now. I I certainly think they're the first Europeans to reach North America. Um, as yet, there is still only one uh, confirmed Viking settlement, which is at Lanza Meadows on the northern tip of Newfoundland. Uh, there was a one that, that was a possible a couple of years ago that, that didn't pan out. Um, it seems fairly clear that they did move further south, perhaps along the coast of Maine, um, maybe uh, into the St. Lawrence River, 
Um, some people think they even got as far as New York. Um, they didn't seem to settle in any sort of greater degree. Lanza Meadows seems to have been occupied for at least a year, so they're there for a little while, and we know that they intermittently come back. But uh, I don't think we could say that it's a colony. There's no permanent base there. Okay, great. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's sort of like the catharsis of the TV series on Discovery uh, that I mentioned early on, uh, where we actually try to search for the Vikings down further south from uh, Lone South Meadows. It's, uh, it's quite interesting to look for Vikings in America. For some reason, it's very, very popular. And that brings me to the last question, which might be a little bit tricky. So we'll, we'll keep it short, Neil, it's for you. It's from Henri Leblanc, um, about the recent romanticization of Vikings. It's, it's very popular at the moment. Um, uh, Henri here, he thinks um, that the Vikings were little more than the ISIS murderers of their time. And um, I'm glad you're going to answer that, but I know it was a very treacherous time and a lot of different peoples and uh, groups of peoples were um, involved in slavery and, and warfare. So uh, please, how would you like to answer that question? I'd answer it in two ways and I'll be, I'll be short. Um, first, I think that this romanticization of the Vikings is, is not particularly recent. I think it's been going on for centuries. Um, you know, way back into at least the 1700s, people got very excited about Vikings. Um, and they've been used and abused in all kinds of ways during that period. Uh, in terms of um, viewing them as, as, as essentially sort of terrorists or something on those lines, uh, I, I'm, I try to, I'm a bit careful with kind of those comparisons with modern situations, but certainly the Viking raiders were, were undoubtedly bad news. But most people in the Viking age stayed at home and never did any harm to anybody. Um, so the, the Viking world is very big. There are lots of people doing all kinds of different things. And the actual raiders, the kind of classic Vikings, are, are a tiny minority, really. So I, I'd answer it like that. That sounds great. And uh, now has the time come to say thank you to both Lawrence and Neil, and Neil especially for staying up so late. And, uh, and I hope um, we had a lot of questions, a lot of interest for, for, for both of your talks. And, and before we leave now, I'd like to just mention next Monday so that everyone knows what's going on in a week from now with um, uh, the talk then will be Explorers and Disabilities, Boldly Facing Every Challenge. And the host next week will be David Dolan. I hope you all have enjoyed this uh, talk. I have very much uh, enjoyed it and I learned a lot. So um, thank you to both Lawrence and Neil and uh, I wish you a very good night, all of you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>